The Chicago Bears say something is different about the locker room this year and that players are building closer relationships as they prepare for 2023. You are Locked On Bears, your daily Chicago Bears podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm here to bring you your daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. You can follow me on Twitter, at CoxSports1. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, at Locked On Bears. You can like Locked On Bears on Facebook. Join the Locked On Bears Facebook group for even more Bears talk. And make sure you hit that subscribe button on the Locked On Bears YouTube channel to keep up with all of our video podcasts as well. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL, and they'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. On the show today, we'll look at the changes in the Bears locker room, the changes from a relationship side, why the players are feeling a little bit more tight knit, a little closer together, a little bit more bought in and engaged this off season in particular. We'll hear from Eddie Jackson uh, as one of the longest tenured current remaining Chicago Bears on just more specifically what feels different this time around. And we'll try and understand a little bit more of why we'll hear from new Bears tight end Robert Tanyan about the process for him coming in as a free agent, as an outsider to the locker room, but an insider to the offense and how that relationship building process works at OTAs and minicamp in particular, and how that's so much different from what we see in season. And we'll wrap up by kind of thinking about the lingering effects of trying to tank last season and all the games that they lost and the ways that that can maybe instill, you know, negative vibes, negative energy, negative feelings in the locker room and trying to turn those around in the off season and, and also sort of look ahead and build on what they were able to do positively last season into this year coming up. It's interesting for me because this is such a, a new and different and young bears team that it's sort of an opportunity to sort of reset. I mean, it really has been a reset of not only like the roster and the talent, but also you know, the locker room, the culture, the dynamics, the relationships with the new coaching staff and so many new players, new regime, new top down sort of direction for the franchise. And this is a group that has undergone so much change and there's been it's very tumultuous. And so they've had an opportunity here to kind of set things on the path that they want to. And I, I was really appreciated hearing from a guy like Eddie Jackson, who's been here through multiple Bears regimes and has, has sort of seen different sides of the perspective, the spectrum and is able to kind of give his perspective on what is different this year. Justin, Justin Jones was just in here talking about the difference in this locker room compared to last year. He said last year was a lot of guys on one-year deals. It wasn't really collective. Mm-hmm. As a leader, how do you describe the difference between last year and the group you have today? Oh, it's definitely different. Like I said, it's high energy. You know, guys love football. Um, when you get a group of guys like that that really love and really care about football, um, they're going to go out there and lay it on the line with one another. You know, like I said, you, you guys probably can feel it just going out there practice and just see the energy. You know, we get a turnover. We knock a ball down. We scoop a ball up. The energy is just it's just so intense out there right now. So when you get a, a bunch of guys like that, you know, we're going to create something special. And like I said, we got a lot of young guys, you know, and, and they're doing great. You know, they're coming in, foot on the pedal. They're going all out. So when you got a team like that, you know, something special is going to happen. We just got to continue to fill in those little pieces, continue to work, keep our head down and, you know, come out here and make plays. So Eddie Jackson certainly noticing a difference. And the reason why this stood out to me and why this seems so important to, to talk about and acknowledge is like this was largely the appeal of hiring Matt Eberflus as your head coach, particularly in contrast to Matt Nagy. And I'm not going to go back through the Matt Nagy stuff, but particularly Eberflus was hired more so for his his leadership, his culture, this idea of the hits principle and, and him being able to you know, be that tone setter and leader in a direction standpoint for the franchise. You know, Matt Eberflus was not hired because his defensive schemes are so innovative, right? He's not 
the master technician defensive coordinator type. His defense is fine. Like, it's not bad, but it, like that's not his specialty, right? When you think about coaches being hired, sometimes you hire the the really, really great coordinator that just like, it, you know, Matt Nagy was kind of like that that offensive whiz kid type of, I mean, that was his, the, the perception, right? That you're hiring the guy who ran the Chiefs offense and worked with Patrick Mahomes and that he can take his innovative, creative, effective offensive schemes and translate his playbook here and have the same sort of on-field success. Or, you know, you think about like Mike McDaniel going to the Dolphins or Kyle Shanahan at the 49ers. Like some of these guys are the more like X's and O's scheme technician type of head coach you hire because of that. Matt Eberflus was more like, head coach you hire for the culture, for the leadership and, and the hits principle and that sort of thing. Like he's going to come in and set the direction of the franchise in a, in a positive way and really be that stabilizing force at that, knowing that he, he's not the world's most innovative defensive coordinator. He runs a scheme that other people run and it's not new or original. And he's not coming up with, you know, these crazy new ideas. He's still, I mean, of course, like the playbook develops and grows. Like it's not like he's doesn't have value in that area, but it's just not, you know, that, that wasn't sort of, the selling point for Matt Eberflus. It was this, the locker room, the relationships, the culture. Players in Indianapolis bought in to Matt Eberflus as a defensive coordinator. It's the buy-in. It's getting more out of guys because, you know, they just care more about the person next to them and are really engaged and, and committed and devoted to their team, perhaps even more so than other players on other teams. And so I think now that we're, you know, the second full offseason into this with Eberflus, we're seeing so much more of that take root and guys like Eddie Jackson are noticing, right? Like last year, it was still like trying to get everybody on the same page and try and install much of this stuff. And guys are still learning what the expectations are and how to meet them. Now, you know, the veterans, especially the, all the guys that have been here, like they know they set the tone. Things are sort of in place so that when new people come in, they fit in the culture as opposed to like everybody's still trying to form what that looked like last season. So it feels like, well, well certainly it's not mission accomplished, like, the job's not done. The, cult, the job of culture in an organization is never done, but it does seem like the foundation and the pieces are there in place to kind of keep things now where the train is rolling a bit now and, and things can kind of go pretty steady in that locker room and in those relationships. And in particular, this is the time of year when that happens. And I, I thought it was pretty insightful for what we got to hear from Robert Tanyan about how that process works and why this time of year is so important for it. And we'll hear from that tight end Next on Locked On Bears. The Locked On Bears podcast is brought to you by our friends at Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs make you look good and feel good because their stretch shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and the leg to give you more of that truly sculpted look. They kind of do the same thing as Lululemon, but better. And I think a little more tailored for men. I mean, they think they both do both, but I, I kind of get the impression Bird Dogs is a little bit more in this side of the of the spectrum there, but they certainly fit better than you know the sort of stiff cotton shorts you might be used to. They invented their own cloud knit fabric that stretches so you get a nice slim fit without having to sacrifice movement. And they have anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that helps you keep you cool, that helps keep you cool and dry all day long. I really enjoyed wearing the bird dogs that they've sent us. They're really comfortable. And the kind of thing that you just put them on and you don't want to take them off because they're Easy to wear, they're smooth, they're comfortable, they're stretchy, but yet firm and tight at the same time. It's a really good combination. It's not going to feel too constricting, but also going to give you that sort of support and comfort you're looking for. If you head on over to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL, you're going to get a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL for your free Yeti style tumbler. Trust me, you put them on. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. I'm kind of curious now that this bears culture foundation is set. Now that guys have sort of established what this looks like for this team. Now you can start adding more and more pieces into it and get it to be the best that it can be, right? Like so much of last year, like last off season, there was, Crazy amount of turnover on the roster, a team that got a lot younger as well. And so everyone was still trying to find their own way. Now, still some turnover, but a lot less, a lot more stability in place, but still some turnover. So new guys come in, new guys have to fit, figure, fit into that locker room and in that culture. And that culture has to be established pretty firmly for new guys to be able to come in and assimilate as opposed to like 
new guys come in and have trouble fitting in and maybe shake things up because it's not really like well communicated or well defined or well established exactly when and how and where and what that culture looks like. And so I found it particularly valuable to have Robert Tanyan's perspective as somebody coming in from outside the organization, even though he had a familiarity with Luke Getze and the offensive system, but not Matt Eberflus and the locker room culture. But he was able to pick up on that pretty quick. And also, I think, compare and contrast a little bit from what he's seeing with the Bears compared to not even necessarily his own past experiences in Green Bay, but just what he's seen and heard around the rest of the NFL as a veteran. How are you going about trying to build chemistry with Justin? I mean, just being like, honestly, just a, a genuine person. I, I mean, I just, I like talking to people. I like, you know, getting to know people. And, you know, if you just have a locker room where just people go in there, you're sitting on your phone and you're just chilling, you know, you'd be surprised that, you know, how many people nowadays are just head down and on their phone. But, you know, just team bonding activities. That's what OTAs really are here for. Like, you know, you're going to learn offense and you're going to, you know, figure stuff out and you're going to compete. But, like, what OTAs really are is to have that downtime and close time with those players that um, you don't get during the season because, you know, season's long and grueling. You, once you leave this building, you're not trying to do anything else other than, like, go rest, recover, and, you know, you have a schedule. Um, so just kind of building those relationships, and that's what kind of Coach Flus has, uh, has been big on is just, just trying to get people to know each other, trust each other, love each other, and then you'll go that extra mile for your brother. Tanyan specified OTAs there because that's kind of when he was talking about it. But I do think the concepts that he applied there then or the concepts he went through there apply to mandatory minicamp that followed OTAs. And I think it's a similar thing at a training camp, too, where guys have more of an ability and more time, more flexibility to just to bond, to get to know each other, to share experiences and to share I mean, just to share time together and to really feel like you know and love the teammate next to you as opposed to it just being a football player who's brought in who has a certain job to do. Like, yes, you know, you know, the wide receiver is going to do X, Y, or Z that, and, and you could program a robot or whatever to run that route or something. I mean, hypothetically here, right? And it could just be a machine that runs routes and catches passes. But when it becomes a person that's humanized, that has a personality that you know, maybe you know their family, maybe you know their friends, maybe you know their wife, their you know, their kids, whatever it might be. Like when they become a human being that you can connect to on a deeper level, that brings a certain level of, of motivation and a certain level of accountability for your teammates in that way that brings everybody together. And so to be able to have this time, this, this, this amount of time, this time of year, is so valuable for these players. That's what, like he said, that's what the value of these practices is a little bit more for than purely just like getting better on the field. Like that's, that's part of it for sure. But like, this is, this is such a, a bit important part of this time of the off season for the team. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, when, when a guy like, for example, Jalen Johnson isn't at practice or Nate Davis isn't at OTA's practice, you miss out on some of that stuff. You know, certainly I think less of a big deal for somebody like Jalen Johnson, who, already knows a lot of his teammates. I mean, all the everyone who was here the year before still needs to get to know the rookies, Tyreek Stevenson and Terrell Smith, and you know any of the other sort of outside players brought in towards the bottom of the depth chart or players that weren't here very much last season. You know, he, he can pick up, he'll need to pick up some of those relationships. But for the most part, it's a little easier for him as opposed to like Nate Davis, who is completely brand new and doesn't know his offensive line teammates at all and needs to sort of build those relationships and stuff. And this is not to be like, overly critical of those guys, but just that's one of the reasons why OTAs do matter and are important in a lot of those situations. Also, I think back to last season when, you know, Roquan Smith is holding out, or I guess holding in at training camp. He was around, same kind of thing with Tevin Jenkins too. Like they were around, so they're getting some of that, I guess, but maybe not all of that when they're not on the field together either and being a part of that conversation, but just the general idea of holdouts that becomes a more important part of that equation in, in this time of year. And I think similar thing for, for injured guys, like the injured guys that are actually there that are in the meeting rooms and in the locker rooms and in the training room and maybe in the workout rooms for whatever, you know, what they can do with their injury. Like they're still getting that time to build those relationships and to be a part of the culture, to be a part of the team and to connect with their teammates, even if the injured guys, okay, they're missing the exact reps on the field or whatever, like 
you're missing something there for sure in terms of X's and O's and in terms of knowing the plays and being on the same page with your teammates and expectations and muscle memory and all that stuff. There's certainly real value to the plays being practiced at OTAs as well. But having that sort of attendance of guys there participating is when that bonding happens. Because like as Robert Tanya was saying, like in season, it just doesn't. And it makes me think of like a guy like Chase Claypool coming in halfway through the year last season. Like as Tanya said, like during the year, when you leave Hallis Hall, you leave the stadium, or you leave the practice field or whatever, like you got to do your recovery from, from this time to this time. And then you got to go home. You want to see your wife and kids and family or whatever for a certain amount of time. Like they don't have time to go like hang out on the weekends during the regular season. Whereas like this time of year, as we're in the sort of summer break between mini camp and training camp, you know, we've already heard Justin Fields talk about trying to get some of his teammates down to Florida to throw to, to throw to Claypool and Mooney and more and some of the running backs and stuff to get involved, even in non-football ways. Like, you know, like when the guys all go to a, Bulls game or a Cubs game or a White Sox game like that stuff matters. It's not. Is it going to be the reason between, you know, they whether they make the playoffs or not? Maybe no. But I do think it. it's the NFL is so often about winning in the margins. How can you find yourself to be one percent better than your team, than your opponents? Right. The little things you can do to give yourself just an individual slight edge. And it's those sort of things that I think can go a long way for the Bears team. And again, a big reason why they hired Matt Eberflus in the first place to set and establish that culture and to help these players build the best relationships that they can as teammates. I do wonder how much risk they were playing with that last year, though, given all the turnover, all the change, all the new everything, plus then not only losing games, but also like I don't want to say intentionally losing games because they weren't quote unquote, they were trying to win every game they played in, but not prioritizing winning. You know, this, this idea of like tanking last season, right? Like there's some culture risk there. There's some personality risk there. when you're losing that much in general, there can be some negative downside. So I want to look at some of that. And also that in some of the context of Chase Claypool as well, especially with some of the rumors and discussions and stuff that have been sitting around his personality next on Locked On Bears. The Bears lost, what was it, 10 games in a row last season? That's hard for any player to stomach in the locker room. And especially if your coaches are, as they were, you know, selling you on like, hey, I'm here as your coach to put you in the best position to be successful to win games. You have to trust me as your coach that I know what to do with you for you and us to be successful. And when you're not successful for 10 games in a row, does some of that trust, at least certainly in that moment, erode a little bit? Because it's like, coach, you keep telling me that you're doing what's best for us to win and we're not winning. You know, should we be doing something else? Should I be questioning what you're telling us? You know, do I, do I feel like this team is in the right direction? Do I feel like my teammates are doing everything they can do to help us win. You know, when I, as a player, am putting my body on the line in December of a season where we're already eliminated from the playoffs, you know, what is my motivation to risk an injury? To risk, you know, if you had torn your ACL in week 17 or week 16 or whatever, and then you're a free agent perhaps, or your your contract's not very guaranteed, you know, and your your livelihood is attached to that. Like, players need to have a reason to sacrifice their bodies even beyond just the contract that they have. They want to feel like their teammates are making those same sacrifices and that their sacrifices are going towards something that is meaningful and positive to them. And when you're losing 10 games in a row like that, it can be hard to do so. Plus, you think about all the different players that they rotated in last season when there were injuries and guys were maybe a little quick to go on injured reserve. The team was a little a little loose with just shut them down for the season because we're not trying to win games too much anyway. And all of a sudden you had a bunch of backups in there, undrafted rookie free agents. Like those sorts of things can be detrimental to the locker room culture and the team culture as a whole. When it's so many different guys that, you know, you had like Josh Blackwell starting it in the, in the slot down the stretch because, you know, because we had injuries at at cornerback that you, you know, we watched them deal with all season and Blackwell came here after training camp, right? He was at the start of the regular season. So he didn't have that time in season. Like, like we heard Robert Tanyan talk about, to build those relationships. And all of a sudden, you know, you're getting guys plugged in around you that were signed off the street, or you just haven't been around very long. You don't really know them as well. And so then you don't have that same sort of relationship and that connection that we talked about earlier. And, and I think there was a real 
there was the potential for a real risk there of like this sort of like losing culture. Not, not only a like losing the culture that you had, like losing the culture, but also a culture of losing being established that like, hey, that losing 10 games in a row was OK. Being three and 14 was OK. That's just what we do here. That's just what we're doing. Like it's not it's not nobody wants it but people aren't as upset about it as they should be, or it's, it feels more acceptable or less unacceptable than it, than it should be. And guys can maybe feel complacent. Guys can feel maybe a little bit more selfish to feel like that their, their sacrifices to the team aren't contributing towards some sort of greater good. And so I can't help but think back also to the Chase Claypool situation where we had the report from ESPN Chicago that, you know, reportedly some people inside the Bears building still feel like Chase Claypool isn't very self-motivated and that he hasn't necessarily made the strides that they would like, but there's still time for him to turn things around. And then we contrast that. This was part of the podcast earlier, I think, was that earlier this week or last week, my timelines. That was the start of this week. I think that was Monday's podcast. Then we contrasted that with the quotes from Justin Fields, where Justin Fields specifically noted Chase Claypool coming in being better, and, and he said an attitude change for Claypool. And I can't help but wonder if some of the things we were just talking about with losing so much and tanking and also Claypool coming in halfway through the season to a team that's losing and tanking, if that if that's not something that maybe reasonably affects and understandably affects somebody like Chase Claypool's mentality when it's like, okay, I get traded from the Steelers to the Bears to a team that, uh, that, that did not win a game, I don't think, after Chase Claypool joined them. I think they lost every game that Claypool was in Chicago for, and also the offense isn't producing. And also he doesn't have any relationships with any of these players because he was just thrown into it. And also he doesn't know the offense. Like I could see where that would be a difficult set of circumstances for any player to get thrown into halfway through a season into a relative dumpster fire a little bit there. Like not like the organizationally dumpster fire, but just on the field team continually losing. Like it doesn't get worse than that. You, I mean, certainly like culturally, you know, if there were, you know, arrests or fights. I mean, there's certainly like worse things in the locker room, but we're, you can get worse on the field comparatively. Like you can't lose more than the Bears lost. They lost every game that Claypool was there for. That that could be tough for him. And that maybe this idea of an attitude change that Justin Fields talked about is Claypool coming in this this summer, you know, or I guess spring for OTAs or whatever, and seeing all of a sudden like, okay, wait a minute. Now we've got some wide receivers here. We've got some offensive linemen here. Got a new backfield and some big defensive free agents and some big defensive draft picks too. And all of a sudden it's like, oh wait, okay. So this is a team that is committed to winning. And oh, now I'm getting to know my teammates better. I actually can like hang out with Justin Fields and get to know him. And he's not just a guy throwing me the ball, but also like my friend. And, you know, get to know Darnell Mooney because Darnell Mooney was hurt at the end of last season. So he wasn't around as much to make those relationships with Claypool. So now all of a sudden Claypool can be closer to his teammates, can be closer to his coaches, can feel more comfortable in the offense and feel more confident in the direction of the team and the franchise that, hey, they're going to win more games this season than they did last year. They're guaranteed to win more games this season than last season. We can debate playoffs. We can debate how many more games, but it's a team that will be they cannot do worse. They just, they just won't do worse. I mean, unless, okay, I know it's never say never, but like they're going to do better this, this upcoming season. There's no doubt about that. And so I think that can contribute to the turnaround in Chase Claypool that we heard Justin Fields talk about. And it made me wonder too, if this idea and more so like the culture relationship side of things, if that, why I just want to, I wonder if that contributed at all to some of the free agent decisions the Bears made, particularly in terms of guys they chose not to re-sign. And I don't want to speculate about anybody in particular. Like, I don't want to like, I don't want to sort of like assume or speculate that anyone, like, I'm sure people might jump on right away. Like, okay, like who did the Bears not re-sign? Like Sam Mustafer. Like, I don't know. I don't know whether Sam, and I don't want to sit here and like insinuate that maybe Sam Mustafer was a bad locker room person. Cause I don't think we had any indication of, of anyone individually being a bad locker room person. But you just can't help but wonder, it's like, okay, when they chose not to re-sign certain guys, given the importance of culture and given how things might have been rough towards the end of the season, I just wonder if maybe like motivation-wise and relation and relationship-wise, if that was a factor in some guys they chose to re-sign or chose not to re-sign, even guys that are currently free agents that haven't signed with any other teams, like could have re-signed with the Bears for a veteran minimum deal, but they said, eh, we don't, we don't really want you even as a backup coming back, like... And again, I didn't want to like, I didn't want to highlight any individual players. I did Mustafa because I didn't want people to jump on like a name there. But like, I don't, like, I don't think so. I don't think that was the case for Sam. I think that was more 
on the field related than off the field related. But I just, you'd, we don't really have a good sense of how much and how well these players handled the adversity and how many, you know, and how much the team sort of had to just put up with to get through the end of the season and said, screw it, we don't want X, Y, or Z player back because of how they handled the, the last 10 game losing streak for last season. So I think this culture stuff matters. And I think the relationship stuff matters. And I think it matters even more so because Matt Eberflus is your head coach. That's what he's there for. He had to oversee a very difficult stretch of that last season, in addition to the, the difficult on the field stretch. And I think th- things are really in a very positive direction for this team moving forward, as evidenced by what we heard from Eddie Jackson, Bob Tanyan, and even Justin Fields talking about Chase Claypool earlier this week. That's sort of the big relationship culture aspect of this team. would be curious to feel, to hear what you think about this locker room, why you think this locker room feels closer and is getting better, and what do you think some of the differences might be this year compared to last year or even in years past in previous regimes. You can tweet us at Lockdown Bears. You can post in the Lockdown Bears Facebook group. You can also leave a comment on the Lockdown Bears YouTube video for this podcast. However you do it, just make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you're listening to podcasts. That's going to be the best way to keep up with all of our daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. We're not quite daily this time of year. We're in our slow part of the offseason. Just through about mid-July, we're down to about three days a week. We might do four sometimes. They're not always going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, although that's been the stretch I've been on these last few weeks. We'll just kind of see, and certainly if breaking news comes up, we'll have a podcast for you the next morning to break down all the most important in-depth Bears topics. And of course, you got to tune back in, even when it's not every day, because then it becomes that much more valuable to get your next opportunity to bear down.